Tonight I'm interviewing Kim Marsh. She's had an extraordinary life. She's been a pop star. She's been through triumph and tragedy. She has ended up as one of the biggest stars in the biggest show, Coronation Street. My character in Corrie, Michelle. Yeah. She's not really got anything on my life, to be honest. I mean, Kim's attracted a lot of aggro in the press for being a single mum from Wigan who's ruthlessly ambitious. Actually, I rather admire it for what she's come through. Well, I've never done anything quite like this. It's like walking into the lion's den. <laughs> Gail Marsh. You uh, once said, you know, it's Kimberly is bad news, right? No, it's the Gail. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start again. Kimberly Gail Marsh, you once said, people have written me off so many times, you either lie down and take it, or else you're a fighter. Yeah. Which one are you? I'm definitely a fighter. I mean, there are thousands and thousands of women who come from very similar backgrounds to yours who never make it, yeah. who try but fail. Why do you think you did make it big? Oh, I'm a determined little thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think Corrie's always been my, my biggest dream. The first time I ever met my agent, she said, where do you want to be? I said, I want to be on Coronation Street. Why is it <laughs> such a magical thing for you, Coronation Street? I think maybe coming from the north, it seems to be that big kind of institution where, you know, everybody kind of, you know, gathers round in the house and watches it. I did. I remember having a wash by the fire in a bowl with a flannel <laughs> while Corrie was on. <laughs> <laughs> So that was kind of one of the memories, one of the youngest memories I have. I mean, you've, you've done it all of this, though, already, haven't you? I mean, I've been trying to keep up with it. Broken relationships, your son's not your own, your brother <laughs> dies, you're in fights left, right and centre. I mean, how does this... When you go home at night, yeah. is it hard to switch off from this mayhem and have a normal life? You know, it's really boring being you. <laughs> It can be difficult, you know. I mean, I, I think, you know, in the first year, I, 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 you know, I'd turned a straight man gay. I'd, um, <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd found out that, you know, my brother's killed my husband, you know. And I think there are times, and certainly the baby swap storyline, when I found out that, that Ryan wasn't my son. <laughs> I sat in the Rover's living room wearing a polar neck for about three months, <laughs> crying into a tissue, you know. And it, it, it was kind of... It drains you. Yeah. I mean, you your own life to... has not exactly been a bed of roses. I mean, it's been no. a bit of a soap opera too. I mean, do you mm. think you'd, on balance, if you had a wilder, crazier <laughs> life than Michelle, or is it about level pegging, do you think? In some aspects, I'd say, I'd say wilder and, and, and maybe a little bit more turbulent, but maybe mine's not quite so tragic. <laughs> <laughs> but the journey to the cobbles of Weatherfield has not been an easy one. Let's see how it all started. Kim Marsh is one of the brightest stars on Britain's biggest soap. She's got such charisma and magnetism, but she doesn't try and have it. It's just there. Your eyes drawn to it, which is, you know, as an actress, what more could you want? An instant hit with the public, she won Best Soap Newcomer in 2007, just six months after joining. I think she was up against Eli Dingle at the time. And I mean, I love Eli Dingle, but I was so chuffed when she beat him. <laughs> that transition and that award and that recognition says it all. Fiercely driven, Kim's always wanted to be famous. She always wanted to sing and she was determined one day she would make it. She sees what she wants and she gets it. That's it. It was for her singing rather than her acting skills that Kim first shot to fame when she was handpicked for the band Hearsay on reality show Pop Stars. Open the door. But her first brush with fame was not without controversy. She kept talking about all her nieces and nephews, and there were children's photos on the window ledge, but then the maths didn't add up. Kim had kept the fact that she had children from the judges, which she soon confessed all to her bandmates. She sat us down as a band and, and placed a, a photograph on the table. I went, them's mine. <laughs> I was just like, no. I was just absolutely shocked. We knew Kim's secret, it bound us together as a band. But it was only a matter of time before the judges found out and Kim was given a dressing down. All I say is how disappointed I am. Nigel Lithgow he said, I've got a bombshell for you. And I'm like, OK, what is it? Yeah, tell me what it is. And he said, Kim Marsh has two children. We had 
no idea. The reason she didn't say anything, she was never asked. I said to her, well, if you've not been asked, then you don't say anything. The film crew had gone to her parents' house, I don't know, two or three times. Not a trace of a family. Everything Kim did, what she did for the kids. Everything. If I was in her situation, I wouldn't have been able to have carried that off for as long as she did. But I don't blame her, because at the end of the day, she did the right thing. She got in the band. God. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you did tell an unbelievable porky, didn't you? No, I didn't lie, because I was never asked. If I'd been asked, have you got children, I would have said, yeah. So yeah, it wasn't like, a lie. That's like Saddam Hussein saying, you know, I, I had weapons of mass destruction, does nobody ask me? <laughs> that's slightly different. I don't wh think my children are going to kill anyone, it's particularly. Isn't a, a whacking great big whopper? No. Look, you know, the, when you're in a situation like that, and there's been many times where I have been for jobs in this particular industry and been turned down because I mentioned that I had children. Mm. Did you feel a mounting pressure as it went on and on? And obviously it became obvious that you were probably going to mm. get in, it was going to go places. I would imagine the pressure gets unbearable, doesn't it? You, mm. You've got this huge secret you haven't told them. Well, it didn't start out as that big a secret because I just thought, oh, well, I'll just tell them. A little bit. And it got harder and harder because then it's like, well, hang on, I'm in this bit now, but if I tell them now, then is, are they going to say no? And I just kept thinking, oh, you know, it was horrendous because obviously I'm immensely proud and I want to bring them and go, these are my kids, aren't they amazing? You know, but at the same time, I didn't want to screw things up. You roped everyone into this, so you, once you be began to tell people, the band members were brought in, some of the producers and so on, mm -hmm. how was that for you through that period? It was a real relief, really, to, to kind of start telling people. And at that point, after I'd spoken to the band, they were like, we don't care, we're going to back you. I felt so strong after that, because I thought, right, I've got their help now. This is, you know, really important. I can do this. I can, I can you know... Who was the first person you told? Miley. And what did she say? She kind of went... <laughs> 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 but, you know, I mean, Mylene and I shared a room. There's not a bit of Mylene I haven't seen. Really? <laughs> and Tell vice versa. <laughs> See, I think there'll be people watching you now who completely empathise with you and think, mm. nothing wrong with ambition, mm. I'd have done the same thing. Lots of people will think that. There'll be other people going, ruthless, that girl is, she'll do anything mm. to get to the top. Well, I wouldn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's hardly ruthless. I mean, look, yeah, ambition comes into it, but, um, you know, I will fight tooth and nail to give my children a better life. I wanted to get out of the situation I was in, and I would have done pretty much anything to do that. You know, their lives now is so much different. You know, I, 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 there were times where me and my sister have gone halves on a bag of nappies because we couldn't afford, a, you know, one on our own. And in doing what I've done, in going the route I've gone, my kids, I'm now, I'm, you know, I'm able to give them the life that I wanted to give them. Why did you leave? Listen, you put three girls in a band, there's going to be arguments. You were a born entertainer. There's no <laughs> other way to describe it, wasn't it? I mean, from an early age, you just craved the limelight, didn't you? <laughs> Why were you so determined to be a star, do you think? I have no idea. I don't know. I was just born that way. My mum said I was screaming the minute I came. I mean, there's only my head out. I was singing. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, there's a family history of, you know, wanting to be in the entertainment. You know, my dad was in a band called Ricky and the Dominant Four. <laughs> he was one of the Dominant Four, by the way. Although how dominant he was, I have no idea, Mum. <laughs> And were you soon at school and stuff doing performances and, and things? Mm. Were you always in the school play and stuff? Always in the school play. Always. I have a few pictures, actually, of you <laughs> in your glorious early days. Oh, really? Oh, no. Which could be quite amusing. Oh, oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to kill you. I'm actually thinking a young Deirdre Barlow, though. <laughs> <laughs> it was just before, I think, my dad and my mum took me around London with cassettes of my singing. And so we had photos done that. Put him right off. <laughs> what was the grimmest place you ever had to perform? Oh, God, there's been a few. I don't remember the names of them, but we just... In Blakely, in Manchester. What happened? Some fella punched this woman in the face. While you're performing? Yeah, and they started having a proper fist fight. 
And they had to take me and take me upstairs and get me out of the way. What were you thinking? I was terrified. <laughs> <laughs> Daddy! <laughs> was it your singing that prompted this? Maybe. Uh... <laughs> We've obviously seen a glimpse of you as a younger performer, but let's take you right back to the beginning. Okay. When Kim was growing up, she absolutely loved being the centre of attention. But we used to go to uh, a labour club on a Sunday dinner time. And it was like a free and easy afternoon, you know. And uh, people could just get up and sing. So we took Kim along with us. And she's pulling on her dad, you know, I want to sing, Dad. We were saying, no, it's not for little girls, it's for adults. Anyway, she got up and she brought the house down. She sung Living Doll, Cliff Richard. <laughs> and we just all sort of looked at each other and, you know, it was a real shock. She just, this little girl, she belted this song out. It's brilliant. <laughs> Every week then, they were all wanting, get that little one up, get that little one up. I had outfits made for her and everything, and I still got all these outfits, little tiny tops and that. I've kept them all. Kim had found her talent in life, but at home, things weren't going so well. I run out of work and my business sort of fell apart, really. Um, and I had to sell my house to get out of the mess that I was in, you know. And so, obviously, we, we moved into a council house. It knocked Kim for six, and, you know, she found it hard, I think. Kim, although she carried on with her singing, she went into different shows and things like that, you know. It wasn't happy. It wasn't happy times being in that house. Moving home meant a new school and ambitious Kim just didn't fit in. She said she was happy, you know, she, she told everyone she was OK, except me, she told me what was going on. She had an awful time. She went to senior school being bullied. She did say to me, Mum, I don't like it, they call me names and all this, and she really wasn't happy making excuses why she didn't want to go to school. Despite the taunts, Kim found solace in her singing, and she was spotted by a local producer who recorded a single with her when she was just 13. She wasn't interested in having friends, and she wanted, you know, she was interested in going, doing a singing, doing a dancing. And that was it, and, you know, if people didn't like her for it, but that was Kim's choice, you know, and, and it's paid off. How bad did the bullying get for you? We got really bad. It got really bad. I mean, it's hard enough going to a senior school anyway. You know, I used to dread walking down that path every day. You know, I just, I would, you know, be called names, money taken off me. I had my skirt lifted up in the playground in front of everybody. And there's nothing as cruel as kids, you know, at all. I mean, it, it, it was really hard. I thought it was my fault for a while. I thought it was my fault because I didn't fit in with everybody else and I was different. Can you remember the bullies' faces? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Have you ever absolutely. bumped into them? Uh, I've seen them across the street and they've gone, Hi, Kim! <laughs> Which was just like... Ugh, they should be ashamed of themselves. That's shameless. That's just... That's just wrong. Yeah, but when they said that and you realised that they, their lies were whatever they were, but you've gone on to such great things, did you feel proud of yourself, really, that you uh, come through their bullying? No, do you know what? I felt nothing. I lived my life as I wanted to live it. I always have. Yeah, I was bullied, and it was the worst experience of my entire life. But it's made me stronger. You released this single when you were 13. Yeah. Where the voice, to put it mildly, was a little on the dodgy side from what I was hearing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Can you remember that record? I thought it was marvellous. <laughs> Can you remember it? Uh, yeah, I do remember Can it. Can we have a little rendition? Oh. It's a little burst, yeah. One kiss. Too, too late means another could take my place. <laughs> Minus the ponytail. <laughs> because of the problems you'd had at the secondary schools, you were sent to drama school mm. uh, to escape. There you kind of had a different kind of pressure, didn't you? I, I really didn't like being at, at drama school. I didn't like being at stage school. I felt that we were being cloned. It was like everyone had to be a certain way, and if they weren't a certain way, then it was not acceptable. And what was the way? Well, 
the best dancers seem to be really thin and, you know, and I was, you know, I've always had a, I'm, you know, I'm not a fat girl, but I, I've always had an athletic type figure mm. rather than being skinny. I'm not skinny. I'm never going to be skinny, nor do I want to be now. <laughs> um, Did you feel pressure at the time back, to be skinny? Back then, uh, yeah, I did feel a lot of pressure to be one of the skinny girls. Um, it, it felt like those girls were always chosen for the, to be stand at the front and to do the, the routines and... So to get on, you had to look I like them, and that meant to be skinny. I felt that way. But clearly it wasn't, but that's, that's the way that I felt. And you began to suffer from bulimia? Yeah. I was making myself sick. I was putting my fingers down my throat. I t took a couple of laxatives a few times. Um, I was binge eating. Um, and, uh, you know, it made me feel better when I did that because I thought, oh, right, this is, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be one of these girls. I'm going to show everybody and I'm beautiful, I'm beautiful, you know. Um... But I hated the fact that I was telling lies to um, my parents. And I knew that it was wrong. I knew it was wrong. And um, I remember watching a film about Karen Carpenter. Mm. Karen Carpenter's my absolute idol. And I watched her life story, and at that point, I didn't know what she'd actually died of. And it was all down to her eating that weakened her heart and and somehow uh, it kind of gave me that jolt and therefore I was able to 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 stop do you feel that when you had children for the first time did you start to feel better about yourself because you had somebody else come along that you had to really put your energy mm -hmm. into <clears throat> when I fell pregnant with David, I was, I was 18 years old. And at the time, when you're 18, you know, you feel like you're a grown-up and you know it all. And uh, Looking back, obviously, I've got nephews that are 18, and I think, oh, if I was a baby. Um, and obviously, it wasn't planned. Uh, but I wanted him. I wanted him. I wanted, you know, I, 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 it felt right for me. I was, you know... I, I, it was what I wanted to do. And, and you split up from his dad fairly mm. soon after mm. that. I was 21 when I had Emily, and then she was a year old when, when me and, and Dave split and why up. Did, why did that split happen, do you think, looking back on it? We just weren't compatible. Sadly, we weren't compatible, you know. You're left a single mum. You've got two young children. You've yeah. got very little money. What did your mum and dad say to you? Did they encourage you to continue living the... Yeah. the dream of, of a career in entertainment, or were they more realistic and saying, look, Kim, you better face up to mm. reality here? No, they absolutely wanted me to continue. When I fell pregnant with David at 18, uh, I dreaded telling my dad. Oh, I dreaded it. Because my dad had been really poorly as well. My dad had a cardiac arrest at 49, and we lost him for three or four minutes and had to be shocked. And, you know, that was the most devastating time. Uh, sorry. I'm very close to my dad, you know, and uh, and he was really poorly, and the last thing I wanted to do was make him ill. And uh, I, I was so worried that he was going to be so upset that he was going to be ill. I remember me and my mum kind of talking, and, and actually he was fine. And said to me, but, you know, I want you to carry on. This isn't the end. You've more reason now to go for this than ever and he's absolutely right, because there's no better reason than, than children. In 2001, at the age of 24, you enrolled to study beauty at college. Mm -hmm. Was that you kind of accepting that you wouldn't make it in show business then? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I had decided that that was my final year, and nothing had happened at that point. And I sat there and I thought, I have to change this life. I don't want my children to have this life. It was horrendous. I hated it. It was, it was horrendous. Um, and I wanted to at least know that I could afford to get a better place that, you know, was slightly warmer and wasn't damp and, you know, and I wanted to do right by them. 
So two weeks after you enrol in this beauty college, you find out there's an audition for a show called Pop Stars on TV. How did you discover that? I was 24 when I got a phone call from my mum who said, right, Kim, there's been this uh, thing on TV. They're auditioning at Granada Studios uh, for um, a pop group or something and you go in and I was like mom I'm not going those kind of things do you know how many people be going for those there's I haven't got a hope in hell you go in that's it you go in and we your stood your mom's like you then is she <laughs> yes she is she's a my mom a mean version but she you know we stood outside what, what's ironic is I've kind of come full circle because we stood outside Granada Studios where they make curry um, lining up on a freezing morning in I think it was about April or May time I mean, pop stars was obviously then a complete unknown quantity, but it was to become very quickly the biggest thing on telly. I mean, this is the show that produced everything from Girls Aloud to Simon Cowell. But it was funny because, you know, I mean, it was a huge thing, that show, and, you know, that first single came out pure and simple, and I remember going into, like, shops and they would put the single on <laughs> because I was in there. Someone knows I'm here. That must feel great, doesn't it? You're in a shop yeah, and they're playing brilliant. your record. Yeah, it was absolutely brilliant when we found out we were number one on the live show. It was just fantastic. It was the best feeling ever. Pop stars have made you and Hearsay a sort of national obsession, but the road ahead was to prove quite a rocky one. Action! Hearsay's first single sold over half a million copies in one week. Pure and Simple became the fastest selling debut single ever. Pretty much anywhere we went, like, people wanted to see us. In the UK, Hearsay was enormous. They were completely unique and nobody, nobody saw it coming. Their crowning glory was to perform at the Brits. Bands worked for many, many years to get that live performance, you know, and we just kind of, we was in there straight away. Just before we went out on stage for the Brits, we were, we were standing, listening to the crowd, and we were really excited. Guys, as you hear, it would be a waste if you didn't perform for us. Would you do that for us? If we can sing live, then we will. I wouldn't expect yes, anything less from you. We were up against our critics, but we wanted to go out there and sing as live as possible, which we did, sung everything live, and prove a point. We got booed so badly, and it was all the record industry, guys. I think that there was a, a bit of a backlash in the industry, but there was also a feeling that, um, did they deserve it? The louder they booed, the more Kim was just, like, sodden. She was fearless. She just, she walked further to the front and sang in their faces. Even though Hearsay were mega successful, tensions within the band were growing. We all individually all had our own arguments, and whether anybody else has said that before, I don't know. Maybe I'll be the first to say it, and maybe I'll get in trouble for that. I don't know. Whatever tensions that people believe to be there, it is like a family, normal tensions. But according to the press, the fights were a lot more serious. We loved each other so much in that group that... At times, it could be explosive. At the height of their success, Kim decided to leave. Instead of telling the band herself, though, Kim let the management do it for her. I always felt that I was really close to Kim, you know, that, that we had a, a good connection, and, and, I, and I kind of felt that when she left, she hadn't sat all of us down to have that conversation, or she hadn't sat me down to pull me aside and have that conversation, and... And I was, I, was, I was hurt by that, actually. Why did you leave? Uh, many reasons. I, uh, I was told by somebody who, at the time, I thought was very credible that one of the band members had sold a story on me to a newspaper saying that I didn't want to go to a man to entertain the troops because I was terrified of being blown up, which absolutely was not the case. Do you now believe that band member sold that story? No. No, I don't. I don't. I think I did what I 
typically do. And I blew up. So someone was winding you up, basically? I think so. Bearing in mind, you know, times were difficult in the band at that point because we were feeling stressed, because it was evident at that point that things weren't going right anymore. Mm. When you actually first quit the group, did you talk to any of the band members or not? No, because I was... You were so angry I was about angry what you thought had happened. what I thought had happened. And do you know what? If I caused them any upset or any, you know, and Danny said he was upset because I hadn't spoken to them, and, you know, mm. I do really regret that. That was a big mistake on my part. Because, you not feel because sorry for doing that? I'm really sorry for doing that. I'm absolutely, you know, I am sorry for doing that because I know that I upset them. And I should really have gone to them and given them the benefit of the doubt, but my head was everywhere. I was an absolute mess at that point. You know, at the time, there'd been all those stories about me and Mylene and the fact that we were supposed to hate each other and blah, blah, blah. Did you and ever I hate could... each other? No, I never hated her. I've never, ever hated her, ever. We heard there about the word explosive was yeah. used. I mean, I know Miley well, and she's yeah. feisty like you. Yeah, listen, you put three girls in a band, there's mm. going to be arguments, you know. Physical fights? Oh, no, not physical. You never rolled around on the floor pulling each other's hair? That's only in your <laughs> fantasy, Piers. <laughs> I was so starstruck in the beginning, and I remember seeing, you know, Bill Roach walk past something, and there's Ken Barlow. <laughs> oh my God, there's Ken Barlow. <laughs> Is it hearsay that you met Jack Ryder, yeah. who was, of course, at the time Jamie Mitchell in EastEnders, a huge, huge star? Yeah. Where did you first meet him? In the bar, which was weird because he didn't drink. <laughs> which, which bar are we talking? At Elstree. About? In the EastEnders bar? Yeah. So what are you doing there? Well, we were, used to film Top of the Pops there. Hmm. So we were there filming Top of the Pops. I think it was one of the last times they were going to film it there, actually. And we were singing our second single. So when, but when you met him, I mean, you're in a hot pop band and he is the big hot soap star. Hmm. You see each other across a crowded bar. Yeah. What are you thinking? There's Jamie Mitchell off EastEnders. <laughs> <laughs> Did you think you were a good match from the start? I th no, I thought we were very different. I thought we were very different. And in hindsight, I should have... Why were you different, do you think? Because he didn't drink. He didn't like to, to go out and socialise in that circle. Um, he was really into computer games, um, <laughs> which makes him sound like he's about 12. So, I'm sorry about <laughs> that. Not <laughs> <laughs> he was different. He was different. When did you decide to marry him, or I'm assuming he asked you, but what, what made you say yes? Uh, he was so different to anybody else that I'd ever met. And I thought maybe this was, this was right. After you got married, I mean, your solo career was actually very successful. Then it began mm. to be less successful. Mm. When, you were, when you were dropped by the record label, what were you yeah. thinking then? Because that must have been for you pretty big blow. It wasn't a shock, I knew it was coming, but it was like a, uh-oh, because Jack had decided to leave EastEnders um, because he wanted to go off and do other things, but they decided to kill Jack off, to kill his character off, because they felt that was only, the only way that they could let Jamie go, because he was such a big character. Mm. Um, but then, obviously, when there's suddenly nobody bringing any income in, you then go, eek, what now? I wasn't scared of going back to before because I've lived that life and I've done it and I've lived fine and it was okay and I'm, so I'm not scared of that. But at the same time, all the stuff I'd worked for was slipping through my fingers and suddenly I'm thinking, I'm going to have to take the kids back to that. Mm. That's not what I want, you know, what I wanted to do. Despite the setbacks, Kim, you are nothing if not a fighter. <laughs> Out of the limelight, Kim's star had faded and her marriage to Jack Ryder was in trouble. At that time, she didn't know what, whether to carry on and try and do something different. She just didn't know what was going to happen. But she just knew, I'm not happy. She needed something to reignite her career. And in 2007, Coronation Street bosses provided the perfect opportunity. She'd almost... Probably certainly in, in, in my kind of awareness, just slipped slightly out of the out of kind of big public awareness. Kim was initially offered just four episodes, but she was keen to impress Corey Chiefs. Casting Kim was a risk. Would they see her as um, as Kim Marsh um, from Hearsay, or uh, well, would they buy her as a fictional character? 
In her first scene, she was tested against experienced street veterans. On the first day, she was very nervous, really nervous. Follow that, as they say. Michelle, I'm not too late, am I? I just took one look at her and I couldn't believe how beautiful she was. Is nothing new. And so it worked for the character I play, Liz, to be really jealous of her. Absolutely a nervous wreck, sitting there at the edge of the seat waiting for it to start, you know. She's coming on now, she's coming on now. Yeah, really, really nervous, but very proud. I've seen it. It's Auntie Kim on Corrie. <laughs> yeah, sat with my kids watching that. My grandma was clapping and stuff. It was really funny. It was a bit weird seeing her on telly. I've never really done one of these before. I said to the directors and the writers, we should keep her, you know. She is great. She is great. They listened. Kim was offered a permanent role, and her mum was the first to get the news. Guess who's a clever girl? That's how she said it. And I went, what? She went, I've got Corrie. Oh, I could not believe it. Jumping up and down and screaming, you know, so thrilled that she got this. Because, I mean, Coronation Street. Come on, it's the one, isn't it? <laughs> During her time on the street, she's had some cracking storylines. What are you doing? <laughs> Playing feisty Michelle Connor. And with her career firmly back on track, Kim's even had the confidence to strip off. <laughs> she brings a sexuality to it without going over the top. And I think our show needs that. It's probably fair to say that quite a few people almost wanted her to fail. Her talent doesn't match her ambition kind of thing. They were all proved entirely wrong. <laughs> it's obviously been I mean, a life-changing thing for you, Corrie. Getting a job like that and, and, and realising a dream you know, you're kind of walking to work every day, and I remember seeing, you know, Bill Roach walk past something, and there's Ken Barlow. Oh, my God, there's Ken Barlow. You know, it was like I was so starstruck in the beginning. Then I had Beverly Callard, who kind of come on board and went, oh, you'll be fine, we'll fit in, you'll be fine. And it's been fabulous, because everybody was so welcoming and normal and warm, and that's why I loved the place so much. Are you all mates, or is it just too much hard work? I mean, do you all go out socialising together? Some of us, yeah, some of us. Who, I think who are your best mates in the, in the cast? Bev Callard mm. is a huge friend of mine. Um, she's wild, absolutely wild, but we have such a laugh. We're terrible as well. We can't, we can't do scenes sometimes for laughing, <laughs> and we get told off. But what do you like when you, you know, go on the Raz in Manchester or something? It gets messy. I bet time. it does. <laughs> <laughs> it gets messy You outside. and Bev Callard, I can't even imagine. Yeah, we rip it up sometimes. Me and Bev, Ali King. Oh, but don't move on yeah. too quickly. How messy? <laughs> <laughs> What is a messy night with Bev and Ali? Five, six in the morning. Really? Strolling out of somewhere, yeah. Where are you strolling out of at six in the morning? The casino. Not really? gambling, just drinking. <laughs> you feel like yeah. you're joining an extended family. Yeah, it is like a family and we are quite protective of each other. And, you know, we've all got our own dressing rooms, but we choose to sit in the green room together. Which is always deadly because there's a kitchen full of crumpets. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we all pile weight on it for it. <laughs> Is there a pressure as an actress, no. do you think, to I, I always look perfect? No, is what I will say, because I think, I think actresses come in all shapes and sizes depending on what part you're going for. You know, you can't all look clones of each other because it wouldn't work. You'd all be eligible for the same job. It'd be ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Would you go down the full plastic surgery? Would you have a facelift? You, you know, you can't ever say... I, I will never say never, because I don't want it to come and bite me on the bum. You know, you said you'd never do that. Well, in terms of how you are now physically, you have had a little bit of help, haven't you? You don't mind <laughs> Exactly, can you mean? Well, let me spell it out for you. <laughs> Unless I'm mistaken, your cleavage is slightly <laughs> more enhanced than it used to be. Really? <laughs> is it? Yes, no, it is, yeah, of course. Are you, are you proud of your purchase? Oh, they're marvellous. <laughs> <laughs> Little fun bags they are. <laughs> I mean, without wishing to pry, obviously, but uh, how much did they cost you? <laughs> are you thinking of getting some? <laughs> <laughs> I got two for one. <laughs> um, Ten grand? Oh, no, much less than that. Really? Yeah, much Five? less than that. 
Five? Less than that. Three grand? A bit more than that. Two, <laughs> two, <laughs> two, the price is right. <laughs> Coronation Street was clearly a, a career high for you, but privately your marriage to Jack was falling apart, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. What happened then? To be honest, we just, it was just one of those things we just weren't getting on, um, you know, and I, I'd, we'd had to move to Manchester and he was away from his family, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it was just a lot of pressure from jobs and, and, uh, and moving. And Do you think either of you was more to blame than the other? I don't. I don't actually at all. But what I will say is that I was always portrayed as, oh, well, she's the older one. Mm. And she's the one with kids. And she's the one that's more kind of, you know, feisty and, and in your face. And so, therefore, she must be the puppet master. She mm. must be telling him what to do and picking on him because he looked so angelic. And, you know, all I will say is that things aren't always as they seem on the outside. You then, after this, met another young actor called Jamie Lomas, <laughs> uh, who appeared in Hollyoaks. Yeah. How would you yeah. describe him? Um, what kind of guy fun. is he? Exciting. There's never a dull moment with Jamie. Really? Yeah. In what way? Do you know what? You know, having, having been... Well, I'd just come out of a relationship, a seven-year relationship, where, you know... I thought the fact that Jack and I were so different was a good thing. Mm. In actual fact, I realised that I was changing my personality. And I realised that I am a party girl. I like going out. I like having a drink occasionally. I like socialising. And, hey, there's nothing wrong with that. After about six months, you discovered that you were pregnant. Yeah. How did you feel when you heard that news? Was it planned? Was it a surprise? No, or? it wasn't planned. Um, I had being ill and unfortunately certain medication hadn't worked in the way that they should <laughs> um, and uh, found out I was pregnant. How did he react when he knew? He went, what? No, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, he was fine. He was fine about it. But obviously we both weren't expecting that so soon in our relationship. You know, it wasn't how we would have wanted it to be. But I was and that was that. And were you quite quickly quite happy about it the pair of you did you sort of think okay well this is happening yeah. this is a good thing actually yeah yeah we were happy about it you know we both jamie's got a little boy from the previous relationship billy who's gorgeous and i adore him and love him with all my heart um you know i've got david and emily who are obviously like big brother and sister to him you know they get on so well mm. and how lovely that we're we're going to have one together and, and bring us together as a family Tragedy happened. There's no other way to describe it. And your, your son was born 18 weeks prematurely. Yeah. What happened then? I mean, what went wrong? Was it all a normal pregnancy till then? Did you have any warning that it was going to go wrong? No. Um, I had had my eldest son seven weeks early. Um, my daughter was full term. So there was no suggestion, that, no reason or thought that this might happen again. Um, and that it would happen so prematurely. Mm. So it was a complete shock. Complete shock. I, mean, I can't imagine there are worse things to happen to a no. woman than that, than what happened to you. No. You named him Archie. Yeah. Um, he died very soon after he was born. Yeah. Uh, how did you cope? I mean, how do you cope with that kind of thing? I didn't. In honesty, I didn't cope very well. Um... It's the worst thing that could ha ever happen to anybody. Sorry. Um, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Um, he, uh, he was, you know, it's horrible when you've been looking forward to something so much and suddenly it's taken away from you and it's so unfair. And... As a woman, it's difficult for, for a man, and I'm not taking anything away from fathers because they're very important and they feel a loss the same as we do. But for a woman, you know, you've bonded with this child and it's really difficult. It's really hard, and I took it really hard. Um, and it's only really the strength of, of Jamie and 
um, you know, my family and Jamie's family that got us through it, to be honest, to got me through it. Jamie was, Jamie was a lot stronger than I was. <laughs> yeah, I kind of lost my way a little bit there. I think, you know, it does something to you. It, you know, a part of you seems to disappear. We had a separation. It tears people apart, and sometimes they don't recover from that, but we did, and there's a reason for that, and it's because we're strong. It's been a, an incredibly tough year for you, in many ways. Uh, but you and Jamie have got things back together now. You seem very happy together, and there's really, I guess, a light at the end of that dark tunnel for you. Yeah. Following Archie's death, Kim and Jamie are rebuilding their life together. The most difficult year I've ever had in my life. Um, and, you know, even more difficult for Kim because, you know, she had to go through it all. To lose little baby Archie was terrible. I mean, I was with her all the way. I don't think I'd have, I could have coped, coped with it the way Kim has. Um, just shows you what she's made of. People try to knock her down, but then she just bounces back and gets up and dusts herself down and carries on. And she always will do that. She's a fighter. I'm really, really proud of my mum. I love her lots. After a tough year, things are now looking up. I wanted to start the year off on a good footing, and that's why I decided to ask him to marry me, you know. I just thought, this is it, you know, this is a woman for me. Jamie came to me and said, I've bought a ring, I've bought a diamond ring. And I was like, oh, really? <laughs> Are you going to propose then? And he said, don't say anything, don't say anything, I'm going to do it New Year's Eve. She was pestering me, saying, oh, you're never going to ask me to marry you. And I was like, and I had the ring in my pocket, and I was kind of thinking, well, I am, but... So I just got down on one knee and asked her, and, and yeah, and she said, yeah, luckily. And then on Christmas Day, Kim rang me in the morning. Oh, guess what? Jamie's proposed. And I thought, he just could not wait. I keep getting told off my friends that, oh, you look really lucky going out with Kim Marsh, so... Yes, I am. I am very lucky, and so that's why I'm marrying her. <laughs> What was his proposal? Was it a romantic one? Yeah. I mean, it's Christmas Day. That's pretty... We, that we, is pretty romantic. We had a row the day before. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, can I tell this story? Yes, you can, yeah. <laughs> It's so funny because we were having this conversation and I think someone had asked someone to marry them that we knew or something, and I went, see, they're getting married. I went, you're just never going to ask me to marry you, are you? you we got into this debate about it. We started having this row, and uh, I think I drove off, actually. <laughs> so you'd already bought the ring? Yeah. And there you are, driving off in a fury that you won't marry him. <laughs> and he's thinking, well, that's ruined that little plan. I know. <laughs> so you get to Christmas Day, are you talking to him now or not? Yeah, no, we're fine. He gave me this letter and he went, yeah. So I opened it. It's behind where we sit. So then I'm finding all these little letters everywhere, all these little things. It's, it's under where we keep the champagne. It's here, it's there, it's where David lays his head, la, la, la. And the last one was, it's where the magic happens. <laughs> I thought, well, that could be anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a look, and uh, there was this other letter in the bed, and it just said, I love you. And I thought... Oh, there's me, dozy me. Oh, I'm really happy with that. I'm just really romantic, thank you. And then he went to, oh, have a look in, in the bed. There might be something else there. So I'm looking, I couldn't find it. It was there about 20 minutes. I couldn't find it. He hid it in the duvet, this box. <laughs> opened it, and the ring was actually, it fell out. And I just kind of went... <gasps> <laughs> I don't think I breathed for about five minutes. And I looked at him and I went... Eh, it was literally like that, and then he got down on one knee and proposed to me. Really? Yeah. Congratulations, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> you think this is it now? He's the one. He's absolutely the one. I don't want to be with anybody else. I don't see my life without him. He's, he's absolutely... He's my rock, he's everything, and we've been through... So we, we had a separation because of what happened, you know, the year that, that we had. 
it tears people apart and sometimes they don't recover from that but we did and there's a reason for that and it's because we're strong and we'll keep being strong you're 33 now yeah. and I mean as we've now discovered your life has been almost as big a soap opera as the character you play in Coronation yeah. Street do you sometimes feel my life's just so like a soap opera I do feel like that sometimes but I love my life I love my life would I you change anything no. good and bad no not at all because the bad things the bad things that have happened are the reason that I'm strong and I am a fighter and I do keep going and I think that you know you have to be challenged in life it's what makes it exciting and it's you know it's great Jim Marsh good luck thank and you thank very you very much, much. <laughs>